we all know the expression, uh, walls have ears. But when, I, uh, when we moved from California here to uh, Georgia and I got my job at Robbins Air Force Base, I was assigned a cube right next to an individual that uh, over the years I had, I've gained great respect for. He's a, a good guy. Uh, he's a good husband, uh, great father. But I couldn't help it. Whenever he called his wife or talked to his wife over the phone, I couldn't help but eavesdrop. And of course, I'm sure he eavesdropped, uh, inadvertently eavesdropped all my phone calls to my wife. But I remember one day, uh, it, was, it was funny. I remember one day he was talking to one of his sons on the phone. And I remember him saying, you don't want me to come home now, do you? Of course, I didn't hear his son's response, but he never left work, so I assumed that response was, no, I sure don't want Dad to come home for what I was doing. Um, I will tell you, raising four sons is probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. Uh, one thing I can say for sure, whenever I set down rules, I know that most of the time they probably feel like I'm persecuting them. But it's not really that. I mean, when I set down rules, Tracy and I are really trying to be able to help develop character and respect and obedience in them, something that's going to help them in the future. Um, one thing that we were very insistent upon while they were growing up were bedtimes. Uh, they absolutely hated the bedtime rule that we had. But you know, one thing that we did find out, oh, and as a kid, I hated the bedtime rule as well. My mother made me go to bed at a reasonable hour. But one thing we did find, which was ironic, the kids, my four boys, behaved better. They actually did better in school. They fought less. And they were actually more obedient and more agreeable if they went to bed at a reasonable hour. Just the way it was. In the same way, Good character is something that can really only be developed through obedience. Now this week, while I was reading the book of Mark, I was moved by something that I've read it a million times, but I was moved by some unexpected, uh, by some unexpected uh, examples of obedience. So today, um, I'd just like to go through some of these examples that I ran to, or, uh, that I ran into. I mean, they're probably not going to be profound, but for me they were, and I would just like to share them to you. I mean, they would be profound, actually for me, they were profound examples of obedience, of surprising examples of obedience to Christ and God. So anyway, the first example, the first example, so if you'd like to, please join with me and turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And uh, we're going to start reading in verse 35. Mark chapter 4 and in verse 35. And on that day, when evening had come, he, Christ, said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him now they took him along in the boat as he was, and another little boat were also with him. And in verse 37, a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was also filling. And but he, Christ, was asleep in the stern, also uh, asleep on a, in the stern on a pillow. And they woke him and said to him, "Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing?" On that note, does that remind you of another story? How about Jonah? Jonah, where was he when the big storm was going on? He was fast asleep. He was the only one. And he was the only one on that entire boat that was not afraid for his life. But in third, verse 39, Christ says, Oh, then Christ arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And then they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, the interesting thing about this too, they were following Jesus Christ. And they kind of, I would imagine by this point, they knew he was the son of God. And if he was the son of God, is it not a surprising thing that he can actually control the wind and the sea storms? Well, obviously not because of the fact that uh, they were probably, they were very immature at that point and their relationship with the Lord, with Jesus Christ, had to develop. But anyway, in verse 41 again, And they feared exceedingly and, and said to one another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Whenever I hear stories about that, whenever I read this, I, I can't help but go back, uh, think back to the early 60s, in the old church days. I wasn't around at the time, but I've heard stories from the longtime church members to the old fee site at Jekyll Island in the early 60s. They used to have a, a big old tent, a big old circus type tent, and eight and 10,000 people would meet there. And every year, it seemed like there was a big old rainstorm. There would be rushing winds, uh, 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 rivers coming through the middle of the church, through church services. But I do remember the story that one year, I, I tried to look it up, couldn't find it. It was like 1961, 62, 63, that time frame. There was a hurricane that was actually coming right to Jekyll Island, right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. They prayed, and... The hurricane turned around and went back out to sea. My dad, at that note, just as a side note, at that time, before my parents came into the church, my father was in the Navy, cruising around in the Atlantic Ocean, in particular in the Caribbean. As a sailor, they pay attention to that kind of stuff, the hurricanes. And he did tell me, after we came to the church, he says, you know, since we watched those, I do remember that hurricane backing up. Hurricanes don't back up, but they did that year. Why was that? Because the hurricane obeyed God. Now, the second point that I think is kind of interesting about obedient or surprising obedience. Let's turn to the New Old Testament, please. And it's somehow it's it's, it's related to the uh, first point of the weather. Let's turn to the book of Joshua. Oh, we we'll find Joshua here. Joshua, and we're going to go to chapter 3. And when we think about, um, and this next one is the water. And the first time we think about the water, we think about the, the Red Sea, which is also true. But the example, I'd like to do something different. Let's read Joshua chapter 3. And then we will start in verse 10. And Joshua said, By this you shall know, that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the, all, and the Jebusites. And behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from every tribe, and it shall come to pass... As soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who, who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest on the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters shall come down from upstream, and they shall stand in a heap. And in verse 14, so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests uh, bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of the harvest, that the waters which, were, which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap, very far away at Adam, the city that is beside uh, Zaratan. Excuse me. So the waters were went to uh, down to the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea failed and were cut off, and the people crossed. 
you know, uh, over opposite Jericho. Interesting. My first thought is when I think about this, I think it was like kind of like a spigot. You got your hose running, and what God did was turn the spigot off. Well, that's not what it says happened. What he said was, stop. He stopped the water way back up in the city of Adam, and it piled up into a heap, and then the rest of it just kind of went down. Well, I actually was doing some calculations. Being an engineer, I tend to do that kind of thing. Looking, looking it up, it turns out the Jordan River, which is not a big river, actually flows at a rate of 565 cubic feet per second. And that's kind of the river's an average width of 100 feet, or 100 feet wide. If you assume the Israelites took 10 hours to cross the Jordan, that means that 3.2 million cubic feet of water were piled up. That equates to about 23 million gallons of water that just kind of piled up into this big, big tower. I mean, figure it out. I mean, can you imagine being there in that city? Can you imagine being there in, that, in the city of Adam and watching the river, watching the pile of water just kind of pile up like dirt? But that's what happened. And when they crossed, can you imagine the scene it was? Can you imagine the sound when God said, go? That also takes me, by the way, to um, Job. Let's turn to the book of Job, please. Job chapter 38. And this section of Job is probably one of my favorites in the entire Bible, listening to the Lord talk to Job. But in Job 38, and in verse 8, again, Job is, is uh, answering Job. And in verse 8, he says, Or who shut in the sea with doors, when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I came to the clouds, its gar uh, when I made the clouds its garment, and the thick darkness its swaddling band. And in verse 10, when I fixed my limit for it, and set bars and doors. When I said, in verse 11, thus far you may come, but no further. Job 38, verse 11. And here your proud waves must stop. Do you remember that video we saw a couple weeks ago from um, the, the Good Works program? They were talking about uh, that Mr. and Mrs. Van Ostel went to uh, the Bahamas after the hurricane. Tracy and I were talking about that. There was one thing that jumped out at me that reminded me of this scripture. One of the ladies that was interviewed was talking about how there were 10 feet or something of water in all the neighborhood, and except to her yard, it was only a couple feet, and it didn't come in her front door. The Lord said, thus far and no further. There was another older couple that uh, Tracy brought up. They were laying in bed throughout the entire hurricane and did not get wet. Thus far and no farther. So who obeyed? The water. You know, and there's another one. And again, this one's a very popular story. I'd like to go to this story as well. And the book of Daniel. And everybody knows, well, many people, eh, well, maybe you know, maybe you don't. But anyway, let's go to the book of Daniel, please, for the next, next group of unexpected obedience. Daniel chapter 6. Very famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. Animals, all animals, obey the Lord. Now I will tell you as a, just a side note before we read the story, when I go hunting, one thing that I am afraid of, I'm afraid of getting attacked by the pigs, because I have pigs on my property. I don't want to get attacked by pigs. But you know what? The pigs will only attack me if the Lord allows it. But anyway, let's read the story. Let's not, we're not here to talk about me. But Daniel, chapter 6, and in verse 15. Then these men, the men that were uh, out to get Daniel, 
approached the king and said to the king, Now, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve or who are obedient to continually, he will deliver you. Then the stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet ring uh, signets of the Lord that the, pers- uh, the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. But in verse 18, now the king, he, had, he was feeling bad about this one, but now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no musicians were brought before him, and, and his sleep went from him. He spent all night not sleeping. He was worried about his friend Daniel. And the king rose early in the morning, in verse 19, and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out uh, with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king sp- uh, spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And, the Daniel, and Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Verse 22, My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth, so that they have not hurt me, because I, have found, I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Who obeyed? The lions. The lions. And in verse 23, the ending of this interesting story, and in verse 23, now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury before him was found on him because he believed in his God. And in verse 24, And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast him into the lion's den, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. They were jumped, they were thrown in the door, and they were within probably a step or two of the door before they got all killed. The Lord allowed it the animals obeyed you know i do have another one and the next one which i find kind of an intriguing one i do really find kind of intriguing um and it's found in uh, first chronicles first chronicles chapter 18 1 Chronicles chapter 18. So what else is surprisingly obeys God? All the spirits. All the spirits obey the Lord. 1 Chronicles chapter 18. Whoops. Sorry, 2 Chronicles. Yeah, 2 Chronicles. That's right, that's where I went. Ah, here it is. I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles 18. And in verse 18, and this is a story about a prophet that has come to Ahab, one of the worst kings in Israel. And the Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord standing on his, uh, sitting on his throne and all the hosts of the heavens standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall, be, uh, who shall persuade the king of Israel to go up that he may fall at Ramoth-Gilead? So one spoke in the manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord will say, in what way? Now you can ask the, the question is what spirit is this? Was it a demon? Was it a devil? I, I don't. It just says it. Just calls it a spirit. Um, but in um, 
Yeah, in verse 20 again, Then the Spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, In what way? And he, in verse 21, And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. The Spirit could not do this except by the command of the Lord. Except by the command of the Lord. Now, I'm going to jump back to one other one. Um, let's go to Leviticus 26. What else obeys the Lord? It's similar to the weather, but the rain. In Leviticus 26, and in verse 3, And if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Now, you know, an interesting thing is, I mean, I saw a documentary a couple years back about Greenland. And they were whining and compl they were complaining about global warming. And how global warming, all the glaciers in Greenland are melting. I beg to differ. The problem is, Greenland is not getting cold enough and it's not getting the snow that it's needing. Why is there a drought in California? California gets most of its water from the Sierras. The snow in the Sierras. They're not getting, okay, so it's frozen rain. They're not getting the rain in due season. Why is that? Verse 3 and 4, because of disobedience and it's at the command of the Lord. Now, I, had, I, I would be remiss not to quote another scripture in that vein. If we just jump over to the book of Amos, please. Hosea, Joel, Amos, and Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4, and in verse 7. I also withheld rain from you. When there were still three months to the harvest, I made rain on one city, and I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered, you know, uh, wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. The rain follows the command of the Lord. You know, and the last one that I, I'm going to talk about is one that I find absolutely baffling. But I find it very, very interesting as well. Um, and this one we're going to go back to the book of Mark. Mark, we can start like in Mark, we can start in Mark verse, uh, um, Mark 1. Mark 1, the demons and devils, they obey the Lord. Now, normally when we think of the, the demons and the devils, you know, demons, they're, out, they're rebellious spirits, which they are. But they can do nothing, absolutely zero, apart from the permission that they get from God. And in verse uh, Mark 1, uh, and in verse, uh, let's see, we'll st verse 23, Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, and he said, Let us alone! What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? You know, what does that sound like? Fear, doesn't it? Sounds like fear. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and saying, 
be quiet and come out of him. And then the, old, uh, the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, and he came out of him. And then in verse 27, they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. One last story that I have to relate in that same vein that I found kind of amazing was uh, in verse 5. And in verse 5. Or, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 5 and verse, uh, we'll start with verse, uh, yeah, in verse 5, uh, verse 4, excuse me. Now, let's start with 1. Yeah, man, yeah, Mark 5 and verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the uh, Gardenians. And when he came out of the boat, immediately there, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit and had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him not even the chains not even with chains in verse 4 because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken into pieces neither could anyone tame him and always night and day he came into the mountains into the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones but when he saw Jesus from afar off he ran and worshipped him. The demons, the demon worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice, and he said, "What I have, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God that you do not torment me." Again, what does that sound like? Fear. He was afraid of him, and he, Christ, said to him, "Come out of the man, unclean spirit." And he said to him, the unclean spirit, or in Christ said to him, what is your name? And he answered him saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he, the unclean spirits, begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine was feeding there nearby the mountains. So the demons again begged. And so this begging is, I've had my sons do that. Please, I want to, can we stay up late to watch the show? Or can I, uh, you know, kids, all, you know, they always do it. We always do that. They're always, they're, they were asking for permission. Um, we know, and then we'll jump down to, um, yeah. And so then the demons begged him, send us into the swine that, way me, that, they, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission and the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down to the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. To me, those things are interesting stories. But what does this all mean? Very simple. Everything. There is not one thing that is not under the control of God. Nothing happens unless it has His approval. Let's turn to, um, on that, let's turn to, uh, let's turn to Lamentations, please. Lamentations is actually a very interesting book. Lamentations in chapter 3 and in verse 23. They are new, uh, they're, um, is that 3 and verse, yeah, did I get that right? Um, oh, 37, excuse me. Lamentations 3 and verse 37, excuse me. Who is he who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? Isn't it not from the, the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Why should a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? So what is that saying? That's saying everything, good and bad, comes from the Lord because he allows it. Now the million dollar question here is this. 
if the weather, the water, the rain, demons obey the Lord, then why do we have such a difficult time obeying the Lord as well? We do have a difficult time, at least I do, doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It's fairly simple. We have a difficult time because we have lots and lots to learn. Matthew, uh, Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5 and verse 8. Hebrews 5 and in verse 8. Though he, Christ, was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Now, in my opinion, there's something absolutely even more amazing in all of this. And that is, the one who controls everything, and the one who has everything, who, who demands obedience from everything, has taken very personal spiritual interest in my spiritual, in your spiritual development. It's amazing. It's sobering, isn't it? And let's end up by going to Ezekiel, please. One last scripture. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. And in verse 21. Then I say to them, Thus says the Lord, the Lord God, Surely I will take my children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountain of Israel. And one king shall be the king over all of the, all, for them all. And they shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I, the Lord, will deliver them from all their dwelling place in which they have sinned, and will cleanse them. And to me this is the kicker. Then they shall be my people, and I shall be their God. Take notice of the pronouns. To me, those are very important to me. Um, and they shall be my God, my people, and I will be their God. Possessive. This belongs to me. This is my jacket. These are my glasses. My God. And I belong to him because he says so. And in verse 27, uh, verse 27, My tabernacle also will be with them indeed. I will be their God, and they will be my people. So what's this sum all this up? God is teaching all of us, which includes the United States of America, they are teaching all of us, obedience for our own benefit. He wants to be our God and he wants us to be his people.